Another challenge for the Green Hornet. His aide, Cato, and their rolling arsenal, the Black Beauty. And now, to protect the rights and lives of decent citizens, rides the Green Hornet. Welcome back, friends, to an all-new episode of the Hornet Sting podcast. It's the owner and publisher of the Daily Sentinel, John S. Drew here, and I'm joined once again as I am with each of these episodes celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Green Hornet by the district attorney himself, Mr. Jim Beard. Hey, Jim. Hey. When my glasses buzz, I answer the call. Yes, and I did send you the call. I sent it actually a couple of times. We've been trying to schedule this one. It's been interesting. And and considering... Today is the day. I'm sorry? Today is the day. Today is the day. And yeah. considering this is a big one, it's a two-parter called Beautiful Dreamer. But unlike Batman, it's just called Beautiful Dreamer. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, going, going into this, you kind of have to ask yourself... It, is it necessary to have a two-part episode? Since, you know, we know the show is uh, is only a half-hour uh, drama, so, you know, why did they do, why did they split this one up? Why is this an hour? I think these are the things that I went into looking at this and trying to figure it out. I have a couple of ideas why it might have been. Possibly, if they'd originally tried to sell the Hornet as an hour-long show. Maybe this yeah. was one of the scripts that Semple pitched as a yeah, possibility. Uh, could, could be, and also we know that later on they uh, cut episodes together to make uh, Bruce Lee movies, <laughs> right? <laughs> basically, you know. So, yeah, I think a lot of these things went into to this. But again, watching this now, you, uh, I think we really do have to say, is this worthy of being a, a, a full hour-long story? Or is it you know, truly one half-hour story just kind of blown up <laughs> into one full hour? It, it very well could have been. It very well. And here's the other thing, too. You think about it, we're only a year away from Batgirl being in the third season of Batman. And when you look at the way this thing is structured, it kind of seems like the prototype for the third season of Batman because there isn't anything exciting in the cliffhanger at the end of the first episode. It's not a cliffhanger. It's just to be continued. Uh, co correct. Yeah, I, I I think that's a fascinating uh, way of of looking at it. And and sure, I, I can I can see where you're going with that one. Well, let's talk about this here. We've got the two episodes. They aired October 21st and 28th, 1966. As I mentioned, Lorenzo Semple wrote this script, along with Ken Pettis, who has done episodes of The Hornet before, I think, and will continue to do a few others. It's directed by Alan Reisner, and I think this is the first time he's directing episodes of this series. What I liked uh, about this episode is that it actually begins in the middle of the action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's different so far that we've seen, and and I really like that. Uh, that's a very pulp thing to do, and um, I I, uh, I think it really adds a, a note of excitement to it. Um, we you know we come right into the middle of it. Uh, Greenhorn and Cato uh, on the job. Uh, and going after someone, and we're you know right along uh, uh, with them on the ride. So I, I really perked up uh, immediately when I saw how they began this one. Yeah, it's nice because it's like we don't have the situation that draws him in. He's in. He's and, in. It's, yeah, it's going on, and and it's up to us to catch up with the horn. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> uh, and I tell you. I liked some of the dialogue in these two parts, especially the, in that opening when he's like, if you have any horses up there or extra horses, trot them out to Cato as they're trying to speed along. 
there there is some really good uh, turns of phrase. And again, I'm going back to the pulp thing, and that's really what pulp writing is about. You keep things moving, you keep things lively, and when you can, you slip in a really nice turn of phrase mm-hmm. or a clever wording or something like that. So again, I think we're seeing though that the pulp underpinnings of the character in, in these ones. I had to laugh. I, one of the earliest notes that I made to myself as I was watching this is that we, we almost got to see the name of the city that we're in because they went for the phone book. Oh. Remember, hmm. this is just the city. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, well, let me check the phone book. And you get all excited because it's like, oh, great, maybe we'll find you know, see what city this is. But, of course, it, of course you don't. Right. Yeah. And I got to admit, I, after, after I was saying last week about the helicopter, that here we are with an armored truck now to take on the Black Beauty. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they're going to put the they're going to put the Black Beauty through its its paces again. And maybe this is this is a more worthy uh, uh, adversary for, for the Black Beauty this time around. Yeah, except that we get the tried and true traditional thing of the 60s television that, you know, there's the malfunction of the equipment just before, ta-da, in the nick of time, it goes off, destroying the truck. Sure, sure. Now, don't jump too far ahead here. (laughs) (laughs) I will say this much. We've been commenting all along about how Cato isn't given enough to do. And I did like this because maybe Semple kind of with the Batman Robin thing saying, you know, he's the sidekick. It doesn't mean he just sits there and brings coffee. He's got a brain. Because there's this whole thing with the tangerine room, what they're trying to figure out what it means. And it's Cato who's like, I checked out that it might have been a restaurant or something or a nightclub and no go. You know, so he's proactive. It's a really nice touch. And he does get to do a little bit more as we go along. And there's one note that I'm really looking forward to to getting to uh, of something concerning Cato. But even more so, or at least equal so, it gives this gives Casey more to do. Yes. When Casey gets to get out of the office and and do something, I, I'll really you know take notice. There's something interesting going on here. She goes along with her boss Britt to. Uh, check out this uh, place run by uh, the man named Eden. Uh, they're they're looking through the place, and and I gotta say something. Uh, I think Britt really like drops his defenses a little too easily, and I'm referring to the part where Eden uh, eavesdrops on Britt and Casey as they're looking around the room that has that has the music tapes right. in it. Um. I like it as a viewer uh, and as a fan of this sort of fiction because it, it's a tense moment because you're, you're, you're actually hoping that he's not going to say something totally compromising, i.e. about his identity as the Green Hornet, because he seems to be unaware that he's being spied on. Now, why Brit isn't a little bit more clever and, and think that there's that possibility, I, I don't know. He he. I think by this point he realizes that they're in the the you know the mouth of danger here, or not if not danger, they're in the lair of their adversary uh, at this point. So you know it's an odd moment as far as could Brit have been smarter and watched what he'd say? I don't know. But thankfully Eden doesn't twig on to the idea that that he's the Green Hornet. But what I find really interesting is when. He, when Britt suggests that Casey stay... Yes, I was going to say... Pardon me, or that she goes through the, the, the process. The process, and yeah. She, she doesn't want to do it. This is a really interesting moment between the two of them, and I think it really speaks kind of volumes to their relationship as, uh, as uh, boss and secretary or, or assistant or how, you know, whatever her role is to the Green Hornet not just to Brit. He she doesn't really want to do it. Bruce and or Br- Brit insists that she do it and then she does. I really want to know what's going on in Brit's mind at, at this point. He obviously trusts Casey. Mm-hmm. He obviously is, thinks that she's capable and that he he may also think that he's not putting her in danger, but I get the feeling that he might be aware that he might be putting her in danger by doing this. They know something's up. 
something's going on. They're not quite sure exactly what it is. So, it, again, I, I, I'm not putting this moment down. I actually like this moment because Casey gets to do something. But, again, I, I have to kind of almost question Britt about are you sure that you should be placing her in this position? Are you sure you should be placing her in this position? Like you said, absolutely. And then when you do realize what's up with the subliminal messages on the music tape that Brit stole, and they're there with Scanlon and Cato, and in walks Casey, and he's not on his guard almost like immediately because she went through the process. Right. You know? Uh, It's a wonderful moment. Uh, when she pulls the gun. Yes. I wrote down the word effective and, and underlined it. It's a really, really effective scene. And, and you get this, you know, uh, thrill uh, uh, at that moment uh, when she pulls the gun out. And I love it because Cato's, Cato's not up, up on it immediately. He does take care of it, which I, I really love that, too. But that really kind of blows <laughs> them away <laughs> when she pulls that gun out. Uh, I, I really love that scene. I and, do. And uh, uh, I'm, again, I'm glad that, that Casey is involved in that. And it's all of them. That's what's, it's, it's our core cast in a really tense scene uh, that, that's really taken them all by surprise. And, and then I think uh, K, uh, um, Casey is very effective when she comes out of it. And, and realizes, you know, what she's just done, or almost did. Now, let me ask you this, because we're always joking that a lot of times the villain isn't anything spectacular, but for some reason, mm. Peter Eden stood out to me this time. First of all, in the very first scenes he's seen, he looks very dapper. I have to wonder if he borrowed his clothes from Bruce Wayne. <laughs> yeah, may, may, maybe so, but you know what? You can picture that this is a place that Bruce Wayne might go to. I kept getting, uh, I kept saying shades of uh, Minerva, right? Dur- during during this this whole thing, um, it, Jeffrey Horn's an interesting actor, but I have to say that again in this show, there's promise, but you don't actually get full delivery on on the promise. Mm-hmm. I think. Peter Eden could have been more, but in the end, I don't think he's a worthy adversary. I think he becomes pretty uh, wussy, <laughs> you know, fair, fairly early on. They they get on to him, uh, they confront him as as the Green Hornet, and he he kind of caves pretty easily. Right, and. And after that, he's he's really not much of a, a, a of a threat. After that, I, I did also write this note that the Green Horn is is back to asking for fifty percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's gone back and forth on that percentage. He used to be pretty consistent with asking for half, <laughs> but but he's back to that now. So he, he wants half half this time. Um, but again, it's not that I don't I don't like. Jeffrey Horn, uh, but I, I, I wish that maybe he could have been more more of a threat. Uh, I wish that there could have been uh, a scene with Brit somehow, or the Hornet somehow coming under that whole subliminal suggestion thing hmm. and really, you know, causing a problem with it. You almost kind of expect that, and and then and then it doesn't it doesn't happen. Well, here's the thing. And and, because we've been bringing this up, we said, you know, is this worthy of a two-parter? The story itself is worthy of a two-parter. The problem is the execution is all wrong. The first part is primarily your high concept, you know, subliminal messages, and the Hornet gets involved in it all. And frankly, it's the first part that's great. The second part, even with the exciting battle with the um, armored truck is let down yeah. because suddenly it devolves into now the Hornet's going in for a piece of the action. It's it's back to being what we expect from a Hornet yeah. episode, you know, instead of yeah. really taking that concept and running with it. That, that like you say, you could have had the Hornet under the influence or, or God forbid, Cato. <laughs> exactly. Um, the ep- uh, uh, first part should have ended with Casey pulling pulling the gun out. Right. Cut right there. 
gun comes out. We're looking right down the muzzle. Oh, my gosh. You know, close on Brit, wide-eyed, and, uh, you know, Casey, you know, cut. Yeah. What you have is the 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 real threat is manifest at that moment. Then then we come back. Uh, Cato, you know, takes her out of commission, and, and then we go from there. And hopefully, will that threat will escalate? It it doesn't really escalate. It, it then becomes a fairly standard Green Hornet episode. Not that like brainwashing and all this sort of thing, or or the subliminal thing with uh, with music or, or through earphones or, or things like that is, is new. But it is it is again, it's a little more high concept than than uh, uh, blackmailers or, or things of that nature. But they don't they don't follow through on it. This thing with the armored truck was interesting, but it doesn't seem to really go along with the whole thing with Peter Eden. And what he's doing, yeah, uh, maybe it's maybe it's two separate things that just weren't blended very well. Possibly, but I did still like the whole chase scene and the battle and stuff. And it's funny because as I'm watching it, I'm thinking to myself, except for some stock footage scenes of the Black Beauty tearing through the city, most of the time the footage is pretty original for the Black Beauty, and I think it actually got a better deal in in its scenes than the Batmobile does in Batman. Yeah, I I will tend to I will tend to agree with uh, with that. Hey, I also wanted to pull, uh, point out here that we get a gas gun scene. Yeah, and we haven't we hadn't for for a little while there uh, gotten to see, and we also have the return of Gary Owens. Yep. <laughs> and, it's, and he gets a much better close up <laughs> in in this episode. Um I also like when Cato punches Peter Eden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go Cato. Go Cato. <laughs> and then if if we're gonna go down if we're gonna talk about the the, the ending scene where <laughs> the Black Beauty's sitting there, armor truck barreling down on them, and I love what Cato what Cato yells out. Yes. <laughs> Keep pressing the button. <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome. <laughs> that is, that is, I, I mean, I had to write that in all caps and underline it. Uh, that is, that's a great moment because it's, it's, it's not out of character for Cato necessarily, but he's, he's finally broken out of his calm demeanor mm-hmm. <laughs> in everything. He's worried and what i love about it is is there's a little hint of almost insubordination <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean yep at that moment he's talking to brit as an equal <laughs> he, I, you'd almost expect him to go keep pressing the button stupid <laughs> <laughs> i i'm almost surprised he doesn't he doesn't call him just brit or or, or something in that scene but uh, again I, I i i love it because we're told that the danger is real. Yeah. Cato finally hits a moment in this show where a one quick karate chop or kick is not going to take care of what's going on. And and he's frantic <laughs> at this moment. <laughs> Keep pushing the button. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, it works. <laughs> you know, uh, sp- sp- speaking of Cato, though, because... Uh, in the first episode, there's a scene where uh, the Hornet and Cato are, you know, they they were checking out the Tangerine Room themselves, and there were two guards or something that come in, and they've got them dead to rights with the gun and such. And I love it. If you look at Bruce Lee, he could just simply be poised and ready for action, and that would have been well enough. But, you know, I guess maybe because he doesn't get that opportunity to speak a lot, although... Uh, Semple did a better job with it here. But look at his eyes. Look at his facial expression as he's casually scanning the two of them and objects in the room really quick to yeah. size up what could take out his opponent. Yeah, I know I, I know what you mean. It, it, I think a lot of people are here just to watch Bruce Lee. Mm. Which is unfortunate because there are other nice things going on in this show, but I'm not going to fault people for that. But yeah, uh, he he knew what he was doing. He knew his his personal space, his surrounding space, intimately at, at all times. 
uh, he puts forth so many interesting things with Cato. Uh, with he's he's like a leopard. He's like a cat. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and again, I'm going to go back to this. This is why I like it when the cool, calm demeanor breaks and and snaps at that moment, and his outburst to to Brit. Uh, I, I think really speaks volumes. Again, we're informing the audience that this is not going to get taken care of very easily with a karate chop. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. I lost my. That was that was my that was my train of thought. I get well, talking about Bruce Lee, and this is this is how these things go. Well, let me ask you this, um, yeah. because we haven't brought it up at all yet, and I'm sort of towards the end of my notes already. But this way I can bring it up as a question before we get into my my last note. Vanessa, we haven't brought her up at all. Yeah, um, I think that uh, she really reminds me of the the girl in the earlier episode that... uh, The one that uh, Britt takes the lunch, although he shouldn't. (laughs) The lawyer. Yeah, um, this character, Vanessa, I, I... I like the character, but it, she goes back and forth. I guess I'm assuming that what we were meant to believe is that the ditzy, the ditzy version is not how she really is. But but her characterization tends to waver, yeah. In my opinion, in this. Uh, but he, it looks like Brit tends to know a lot of the same type of women. <laughs> yeah. In this, yeah. Same type of women. I, I, I love same. Casey's line at the very end. That's what I was Casey's getting to. I love that last 14 line. Fourteen carat stinker. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but does that mean that she's jealous? Well, you know, there could be a We've bit of a about jealousy. Yeah. 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 We've talked about this before. I th- I, I think it means that she's jealous. It, it very well could another be another great level to ca- to Casey. Yeah. But but it also plays in with the whole thing of the fact that he's not going through with his responsibilities by having lunch with the employees while he goes off and has lunch with Vanessa. Yeah. Yeah. And I will agree with her. He is being a, a stinker at that point. Honestly, I think if he's, you know, does this thing and the the employees expect it and he wants to keep happy employees, he should follow through on that. So he's he's being selfish. I mean, that's great. That's a that's a wrinkle to the character. He's he's not st- made out of sterling gold. He's a fourteen carat stinker at this moment. But but a, but again, I, I think that there's more going on with Casey than what it might appear to be on the surface. Mm. It's not just that she, he's a stinker because he's not going to uh, have lunch or sit or talk to the employees, but because he's because of what he is doing instead, running out with this woman. Right. You know, as we're talking about this, I suddenly just got this wild idea. Like, it's a shame they never got to do it on the show, considering the extent of the set for the Daily Sentinel that they have, that they didn't do something where maybe the building was taken over and Britt has to sort of slip out as and and you know become the Green Hornet and try and save the day and at the same time mm. not make it look like the Green Hornet saves the day. Mm. We should we should write a Green Hornet episode. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so have you got anything else that you wanted to talk about here? No, no, those, those were the highlights. Yeah. Um, overall, I I wish it was more. I don't think it necessarily is worthy of being the first two-parter of this show. Um, it probably could have been tightened up. And I know that we've complained about some of the episodes being only 30 minutes and maybe you know more could have been done. But I, I don't know. I think I agree with you where great setup in part one and, and then not, not the follow-through. Uh, in two, Peter Eden could have been a, a lot more. I, I think he just kind of folds just, you know, too easily. Um, but uh, but thankfully, the Black Beauty and the Armored Truck thing, you know, brings it up a, a notch uh, uh, there at the end. But I'm glad for uh, our Cato bits, and, and I'm really glad for the, the Casey stuff, too. Okay, so then let me ask you. 
Must watch, mm. can watch, or pass? I'm going to give it a can watch. Okay. I'm definitely not down on it at all, but I, I'm not, I don't think I'm as excited about it as I, as I should be. Hey, hey uh, you know how I feel about Programmed for Death. That should have been a two-parter. Hmm. Okay. Could have been way more with the leopard, way more with the diamond consortium villain people. That that could have that should have been two parter. High concept. Uh, that could have really been been something. This one, eh, probably not. Okay, I'm gonna actually say must watch, and and. Uh-huh. It's, okay. it's really ju- not because this is an excellent story or anything like that, but because it is the first two-parter, it gives you an idea of what this show could have been, in, and, and maybe not for all the best reasons, but it could have been yeah. if they had done it as, as multi-part stories. It is Lorenzo Semple. There is some great dialogue in it, but yeah, I like I say, it. I think it falls apart in the second part. You're right about uh, Peter Eden. Um, and even though there is this better battle, actually, with the armored truck, it doesn't save it overall. But I still say you have to see this first. Just if you're if you're talking about watching selected episodes from the series like we're, we're kind of ultimately doing here. We're sort of putting together a, if you're going to watch it, these are the ones you must watch. These are the ones you can. I would go with, sure. you know, watch it only on the historical notes that this mm. episode, this story possesses. Yeah. I I I, I, res- I respect that. I personally could not stand behind it that much. Okay. Uh, because to me, I would I would really, yeah, I w- I would need to be way more excited about it to say <laughs> must watch. But it's de- it's definitely a can watch. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, there there you go, folks. I, now <laughs> there are two more two parters coming up in the series. There's one yeah. I think actually in January and then another one is actually the final two episodes of the show. Hmm. With their own bang. with their own uh, Joker's flying saucer episode. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't know if it's that, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting I'm looking forward to getting to that point. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so until next time, folks, stay tuned. We'll be back on November 11th when actually the next episode of The Hornet then aired in 1967. And the episode has the Green Hornet facing a group of criminals with a laser ray at their disposal in the appropriately titled The Ray is for Killing. Woohoo! Yeah. Boy, does that sound exciting. Well, it's, it's <laughs> a really I mean, it high does. concept. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you think about it. So yeah. until then, folks, um, as we go out, we're going to play some audio that listener David Mosca sent us of Van Williams being interviewed by Mike Douglas back in 1967 about the Green Hornet Show. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for all the great programming we've got here on the Hornet Sting and the Bat Cave podcast as we wrap up the third season of our reviews there. So until next time, folks, thank you so much for listening. Once again, Jim, take care. Let's roll, Cato. I think the chance to talk to the new Green Hornet, Van Williams, but Van. Then- Okay. You've been on a promotional tour promoting the fact that the show is coming on the air September uh, 9th. September 9th. 7.30 Eastern, Western, 6.30 Central. How many cities have you visited thus far? This is a, a 12 city tour. 12 cities in 12 days. In 12 days? 12 days. Uh, and I look like it. <laughs> uh, we... Uh, you know, out on the road, they've got all, there are five regulars in the show, and they're hitting every part of the country. And we're coming on in, what, I guess it's two weeks. Yes, so, uh, you know, the timing is right. Now, you've filmed about seven shows thus far. Seven shows. Anything uh, happened? Have you had any close calls? Because I understand oh, yeah. a lot of wild things we've happen had when you're filming a show like that. We've had a lot of close calls. We have two or three injuries already. Uh, oh, but, I'm sorry I guess, to hear that. Not me. Oh. <laughs> Just the stuntmen. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's taken for granted. Now, they uh, have uh, 
We had one guy that was cut badly on the forehead with some barrels falling off. A guy who was swinging on a rope and it broke and went into some barrels and cut him pretty bad. Tody, would you keep your hands off of him, please? Please, he you're, not just, to touch the you're not supposed to touch the merchandise. Just adorable. Thank you, Dottie. <laughs> you you, you told us we couldn't touch the, the girls That's at the right. contest, it's, right, Vern? Totally fair. I'm please, only so. touching a hornet, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but he's not too green, so watch it. I don't know about that. Uh, but you've had a, quite an athletic background. You played football. Yeah, so that, that's a big help. Well, I do is. too. We have so much in common. We play football. <laughs> yes, I play football. Is there any one thing that the series is aiming for, Matt? Yeah, we're a, we viewers. would like. Yeah, that's true. But the type of viewers we want are a little bit older than Batman. We're beaming. We're straight. We're honest. We're uh, melodramatic. It's a, it's an honest show. We have a... The basis of it is about half action. It's a, I call it a metropolitan James Bond, which is what it is, you know, with a mask. How straight can you be with a mask? <laughs> uh, that's You're going to wear a mask? Yeah. Oh, well, it's a shame to cover up your eyes. Tie. Just beautiful eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Don't touch you the have fellow, please. please. Okay. Could yeah. you put your hand on your yeah. own chair? I think he's nuts about me if you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I she wish you could have seen today. Can I tell them? What? In my dressing room before the show? Oh, no. Banging on my door, banging on my door. I had to let him out. <laughs> oh. And I think the thing that, that my little girl was most fascinated about when I went to California and, and was able to visit the set of Batman, she wanted to know about the Batmobile. Now, I understand mm -hmm. the Green Hornet has a kind of a special car, too. They call it the Black Beauty. I call it the Black Ugly. It yeah. is... Uh, it's a customized Imperial, and it's got 28 different things on it. It's got machine guns, uh, rockets, missiles. They're trying to outdo the uh, Bond car, the DB-5 they had in uh -huh. that show. And the trouble with this car is everything in it is practical. They built all the controls and everything into the, into the front of the back seat on a panel that folds down. And uh, I can fire the missiles and the rockets and the brooms that sweep up the tracks and the... The uh, tax it throws, the oil slick. The Are gas you ever gun. able to take it off the set and take it home with you? Yeah, well, they're built, not me. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't touch it. I can't drive. But they neglected to think that we might have to drive the car occasionally. And they moved the seat way forward, bolted it down, and they got about this much room between the front seat and the steering wheel. Can you make uh, it? Can you get in? Well, they have to have a midget, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, the. Uh, like I was saying, everything is practical. They're building two cars. One we will use, the other one goes out on personal appearance. You appearances. brought some film along, didn't you? Yes. Can we show it, please? Mm -hmm. Show it. Will you, Ernie, please? The Green Hornet. That legendary nemesis of crime with his loyal companion, Cato, thrilled most of us as kids in one of radio's longest runs. Let's push this aside, Cato, and go through. I'm with you, boss. <laughs> Every show there are products, and you, how many products will be here? Are black, uh, are Green Hornet rather uh, sneakers? Uh -huh. They're kind of oh, nice I looking. I think the kids them. will love those. Yeah. Oh, Very I love them, Mike. I said black because they are black, oh, they're not I green. Love Put them on. Want them, Tony? Oh, them I love them. Hey, Tony, them. I got something you'll like better. Look here, Green Hornet peanut butter. Uh -huh. <laughs> Taste oh, it, please, Tony. sure, Mike. How about Green Hornet frozen bananas? That'd be <laughs> yeah. hey, frozen yeah. peanut butter. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, Tony, right. Will you introduce the uh, stoppers, Frank Hubble and the stoppers, Tony, please? Uh, right, I, I want to <laughs> I introduce to you a wonderful group of around called Frank Humble and the Stompers. <laughs> Frank Hubble and the Stompers. <laughs> 